Cool. All right, so we are officially recording. All right, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, this is the fifth PM. So we're going to be going over like a uh, bunch of unique features. So I know I mentioned that we were going to do post processing. Um, this there's like ninety two slides, and I decided just to cut it. Um, it should be fine. Um, but honestly, post processing you can add pretty quickly. Um, I'm gonna have to talk to William about one little thing on it because I think the rendering pipeline messes with. Our specific stuff, but I don't have confirmation on that. So stay tuned, I guess. Uh, so UI UX is the first thing I'm going to go over, and this is going to touch very heavily with sound. So at certain times, we'll see things added that aren't part of UX. That's just because I was doing this in tandem. Uh, but keep in mind, you want to have everything in groups. You want to have everything nested within items because it's just going to make your life easier having a bunch of holders. And those holders be labeled well is going to help you like know what menu should pop up where. And especially when we talk about like things being active and things not being active, you need to make sure you do this correctly, or you're going to have weird errors. So yeah. And also some of the artsy stuff that I show, um, obviously is opinion based. So it's very easy to start. Literally, just make it like you're making a regular object, except you go to UI. Um, so you're going to want your base level to be a canvas. Your canvas will also get a event system, just a fancy little thing you can work with. Um, I usually nest it within the UI as well, but that's just preference. And then I have my actual UI holder, which is where actually things start. Everything before this is just artsy farsy stuff. Maybe put the UI manager at the top level, but that's just because things will get enabled and disabled and you want to make sure that your managers are never disabled. So it's basically a invisible layer. But um, as you can see, the rectangular, uh, yeah, the rectangular transform over there, that's actually wrong. Uh, what it's going to be eventually is going to be something called a stretch, which is just three arrows that point up, down, left, and right. And if you set it up correctly, it'll just stretch to the whole window and it will just, you know, it will just have the entire screen encompassed. And you're going to have to make sure you keep track of those rectangular transforms because that's how your actual objects are going to rest naturally in your UI. So having those set up well makes it a lot easier. So I do the same thing. I literally just make two more empty holders, like the holder UI and then the pause menu are just both empty holders. And then I'm going to make the final holder before you actually do some fun stuff. And now we have our first object is going to be an image. So simple frame circle, just go to UI, go to image, make it. I'm going to put a little object in this. And now it's just registered in. So as you can see, now I do have the stretch in there. And what it's going to do is it's going to stretch out as far as it can go from the parent. So the parent of the background is the menu holder. So I also make it so the menu holder itself is only a subset of the screen, which you'll be able to see more in a second. And that makes it a little easier to see. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to double click on the pause menu. This just makes it so you can actually see it because before you can kind of see some of the haze off to the side. So what I did here is there's actually two backgrounds so far. There's one that goes to the entire screen before the menu holder has a little subset that's called the haze and that's just that little like uh, darkened background it's literally just a pure black um screen with the alpha put down a little so it's still see-through-ish uh okay it's not opaque it's um translucent yeah translucent i passed elementary science i promise um and you can see it here too so what's happening is as these layers go down, you're going to have smaller and smaller elements. And that's just because it helps center things. It helps make things neater. So this is the haze, the big circle. And those white lines are actually the whole screen because it stretches all the way out. And you can see the entire screen. So that's the reason that I'm telling you to open this menu, because now you can see how it will look on the screen when it projects itself without any artsy fartsy stuff. So that, like I said, that's the screen for the player. And what you see there, the little wood box, that's going to be our pause menu. So we're going to be working off of that. But the reason it's nice to have that menu art on there right immediately is that anything that goes into the menu holder for now on is only going to be encompassed within that box. 
in terms of how we made the UI. So if you actually um, go down layer, yeah. So you can actually see that I have the boss paint uh, the uh, base pause menu, and it's centered right in the middle, and it's centered to the menu, not centered to the um the screen, which is important detail. And now time for text. So text is really because you have to define a size for it. If you don't define a size for it and you write words, it looks bad. So uh, you need to make sure that your width and height are adjusted properly. Uh, once you do that, it will actually look good. So in this case, I kind of did a bad here. I probably changed it later. But um, you actually see the transform, the uh, little thing at the top left. That's saying that it's centered to the object. And then I said, okay, from the position Y, move it up 500. Since the menu itself is like that, I can just instead say from the top, measure down. Technically, we don't really need to worry too, too much about that, but it's just easier to think of it when it's relative to what it's supposed to be. So like the title should be at the top. So I really should change it to be um, the rectangular transform to the top, but that's not going to break anything. It's just a little weird thing to think about. Um, but now we're actually going to get into stuff that affects gameplay. So we can actually have a menu that works. Uh, now we're going to do buttons. So we're going to kind of half go into buttons and then half go into buttons later when we're talking about sound because they overlap on what you can do with them. And you will see both. I promise the art for the buttons gets better. I, I made some dev art, but at first I was just trying to use Unity assets. And, as you can see, that didn't work out too well. Um, so as you can see, the actual image, that's the image of the button. So if you had your art team make a button for you, you just quite literally, um, you put the sample image in there and it would just automatically do that. If it's not a white image, so if you see how that color is a bit gray, that means that there's going to be a, um, basically like a shader that's thrown on top of it. It's, it's more just like a brush that's applied on top of the image that makes the color kind of adjust to that color. So this menu initially the button was initially white, but I had a bit of gray. So when I hit that color and I told it to go to gray, it shifted the colors to be a little grayer. So keep that in mind. It's a really big thing. That's all images, even sprite renders. If you change a color in a sprite render besides white, it will overlap the color. Just bring that up here. And also one more thing, uh, when you're doing your images, there's a few different things. I don't have arrows for this, so I'm just going to play with my hand. But um, you'll see different types of image types. Simple means that it's just going to have the image as it shows, but it will stretch according to how big the object is. So if you're having it as a simple object instead of a tiled image, which is probably what you should do if you're going to have a specific um, uh, pixel size that you want, uh, what you can make sure is you can make sure the height and width, the ratio is the same to the image that you have in your file. So just check your pixel counts. Not too big, but it'll make it look bad. And if it looks bad, it's such an easy fix that it's not worth it to not do it. Um, so as you can see, the button itself has um, a little nested thing called text. That is where you see resume coming from. It's just text.tmp. It's called a text mesh pro. But when you're referring to his code, you have to add a human GUI to the tag. Again, jargon. But um, see, this is me hard coding the button and saying, I want this button to be this exact X and Y. But that's boring. That means that every time I add a new button to the screen, I'm going to have to manually code the spacing and all that. So instead, I'm going to use a different UV object. So to do that, I'm going to make another button. I'm going to make another empty menu like I did before. And remember, all of these ideas is you're going to make a bunch of holders that just help you center objects and localize what you're going to be doing. So as you can see from the button holder, I added an image for the time being, which is just a white screen, and that's stretching to the whole um, button holder object or window more accurately. And as you can see, it's a subset of the menu. And on top of being a subset of the menu, it's um, the whole entire menu. And the reason I'm doing that is because I have something called the vertical layout group. That'll make it so everything that I add inside of that window for now on will be um, basically automatically centered in the way I want it to. 
So I have it centered as up center. Go ahead. So is this sort of analogous to like Flexbox in CSS? Yes, it's uh, an analogous to Flex. So it's very similar. It's just a little more um, graphical on this side. Um, so I have it as up center. Technically, you can do it with up center or down and then left, right, center. Um, but I just have it at up center, so my, it'll try to make it so every object is as high as it can go and is centered to the object. And um, there's also padding you can see, and that's between every object, there'll be a bit of padding on that object. Keep in mind, uh, if you have buttons and text, it'll treat them um, the exact same. So you gotta be a little clever with how you do some of this, and that'll go into a bit later when we're to the options menu. As you can see, Literally, all I did was I took the zoom, the button, put it in there, copy and pasted it twice to make um, options and exit. And it completely already centered, padded everything for me. So it's nice and neat now. Oh, and all of this that you're going to be seeing today on the slides is in the repository. So if you sync your fork, you can get all this code. Just throwing that out there. But now, unfortunately, we actually have to talk about code, actual C sharp coding. So we're going to have three scripts we're going to need to make for this. Oh, sorry, four scripts, my bad, because three were added and one modified. So we're going to have an audio slider, a pause menu, an object, um, a UI manager, which is added for this, and then the game manager, which already existed, but didn't really do anything. But that's going to be edited. And the reason we have all of this is because I want to make a pause menu that changes sounds. So it will tie into the next point too, but um, it's going to get messy at times because we are really already talking about UI that affects sound without talking about sound. So I'll walk you through it. This is literally all the code we need for the slider. It's quite literally to say, hey, there's going to be an audio mixer. I want that to exist. And then this reference, the text match pro UI, a GUI, that's literally just, hey, I want you to be able to display the graphic. And this is the code making it display the graphic. Is whenever the value of the slider changes, it's going to go to the text, the little UI uh, text, and change it. Uh, this is just fancy code for change this to this value on string. Just kind of how you have to do it. Now, if you wanted to actually add like text, like the volume is at X, you will just type it either to the left of this bracket or to the right of this bracket. If you type it inside, it's treating this code. So like you can add one to this if you want to make your numbers inaccurate for some reason. Um, and then um, this is just because how sound works. Um, sound works logarithmically. So you should make it a log 10 function instead of a, a linear function. But that's just anything with sound. So you have to make it a log function. It doesn't do that by default, unfortunately. So just keep that in mind. And it's divided from 100 because the value on this is going to be from 0 to 100 on the uh, scalar. We'll get into that later. Uh, the pause menu, this is literally just going to go to the pause menu proper, and the pause menu folder is going to be referenced. So as I said, um, towards the very top, you'll see the menu holder. That's the pause menu holder that you saw before. Um, and then there's just a few little tech. Uh, then there's the menu open. That's because you need to make sure you have like a boolean or something to flip through. And literally just very simple stuff. There's a toggle menu, a pause menu, and an unpause menu. Uh, again, sound manager exists before we're talking about it. This is quite literally just playing a sound whenever this function is called. Same here. Um, Nothing. Anyone need any help so far? Any got any questions? Cool, cool. Yeah, and um, this is tech, this is literally all the code for this. I just had to chunk a little bit of it. So, um, and this is the whole UI manager. That's a lot of work, doesn't it? Um, so this is just making sure that when an object is um, oh shoot, I forgot to check. I forgot to put that in the slides. Okay, um, so um, he has a, an input manager. I made an input that's called pause, which you can see here, it's the um, input action reference. And basically what it does is he really handles it and you can say, okay, I want all the buttons to be associated with an action. And then you can pass that action in as a, basically a variable. 
And then that variable you say, whenever this action was performed, put in this frame, please. If you don't, it'll be calling this over and over again as long as you're pressing the button. That'll make it nasty. Uh, so this frame has to be whatever code you're using, or it's going to repeat constantly. And then this is quite literally saying, when someone presses pause, toggle the menu. So if it's paused and you hit free, which is the pause menu button, um, it'll go to unpaused. And then game manager itself, I made two things for the actual menu so it works properly, freeze and thaw. So when it's frozen, no input works besides the mouse. So that's literally, again, same thing with the input mapping. I just did one for movement, attack, attack, and aim. It disables it when it's frozen. It enables it when it's not frozen. And the time scale, that's because um, things will move if you don't um, turn the time scale off. So it's just a weird little thing. Uh, same thing with the edit uh, the end game. You have to make sure the time scale is one or it'll be where it ends the game because the game's not moving at all. Like time isn't moving, but it's supposed to end the game somehow. So make sure you're time working. And this is just a little thing. Um, technically, you could just have application application quit for exit game, but then it doesn't work in the EU video editor. So you just have to put this which is just a fancy way of telling the UV editor that you have this if statement that you only want to be addressed with the editor. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm just a bit confused. What does changing time scale affect? Like, in the actual in-game time. So like, so when the game is playing, there's a timer, right? So what it changed time scale, it's just saying, hey, I want the time in the game to stop. No time passes. So any function like gravity, um, I think vectors will still move if they're self-propelled, not a function of gravity. Actually, I know for a fact they do. But before I put, uh, I had the time scale off, but I still had aim allowed, so I could fire arrows. The arrows still go across. But certain functions that rely on the time function in Unity will not work if you turn the time scale to zero, which is just what you want to do. Um, also, things like update functions. Um, so as you can see up on the last page, the uh, update function, that doesn't work if time's frozen, which is just obvious. You don't want things, you don't want game objects to be updating when nothing's going to happen for them. Okay, well then how does uh, how is thaw called if time scale is zero? Like, um, what is because that's permitted to run? And it's so that's because you um so that's because it's a difference in what's happening. So you have update that is called to the engine from time. It is a reference to time being called. So it is only called when time exists. It's specifically tick rate, not time, or not seconds. It's tick rate, which is just happens a number of seconds every second. Um, a number of times every second, sorry. Um, but other functions that you specify, like for example, thaw, thaw is called by code that I've made, so it's not reliant on time. Time is a construct of the engine to call certain functions, if that makes sense. So it's like, imagine it this way, God turns off gravity, <laughs> but that doesn't stop my computer from running. Because gravity, like God pausing the gravity function doesn't affect stuff that I work with. Can you dominate this? All right. Uh, so now we're going to go back to the options menu. Um, so when you're working with the options menu or when you're working with any UI, it's a good idea to disable things that you're looking at. Uh, so there's two ways to disable things. I'll go to the second way a bit later. This one is purely cosmetic for the editing menu. There's a little eye that you have when you highlight something. If you hit that button, it'll make it so it doesn't appear anymore. So it'll look like this. So when I have the options menu edited, editing, it'll actually, I'll be able to see everything. But um, if I don't have that enabled, they overlap because they take place on the same space. So it, it makes it messy. So make sure that you do one of two things. I'll show a second thing later. But eyes for now is a purely cosmetic way that you can edit UIs. Um, so with UI, we're going to add another button for back. And we're going to tie all these buttons together later so they actually like, work. But for now, this code isn't doing anything. It's purely um, pretty stuff. 
third final object, um, the slider. So a slider works like a button, but it has a float instead of a true false switch or button doesn't work like that. It's more like when pressed. So it's kind of a boom, not exactly. It's a little too nuanced for, for who cares type stuff. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm gonna make this a bit weirder than what you're thinking I did. So you can see I actually have the um, master. So master is reference to everything with the volume. Think of it as a little holder that holds all the different assets together. And then I have a content holder that I probably didn't need to make in retrospect, but I like having it. This content holds the slider and it holds the value, which is what I mentioned earlier with the UI slider, the thing that adjusts when the uh, slider value adjusts. So as you can see, that's the thing on the right. Um, so this I did this is so when I'm actually, I can use the same thing I did earlier with the buttons to make it horizontal and auto spacing. If I didn't do that, it would make it so under this, which is 70 in this case, it would be under the bar, which just doesn't look as nice. So if you put it within the object, it only works for like one object down from it. Will that make sense? Because this is getting into the version of nesting that gets messy really quick. And trust me, it does get messy. Um, so ignore the fact that the audio mixers here, I'll explain what that does later. Um, but the value text, like I said, you just plug that in from content to this. So when the slider value changes, everything changes. And now we're going to actually get into stuff that does stuff now. So the slider has a little thing in its function towards the bottom. That is a um, basically whenever the value changes, it'll call everything that you exists here. So you just hit the little plus button and it'll add something that's dependent on it. If any of you work with event listeners, it's a similar kind of concept. Um, it's just a very user-friendly version of an event holder because I don't need to code anything. So what you're going to do is you're going to take master, which holds the code, that actually adjusts everything. So that's where the audio side of code is in master. And you need to do this because you basically need to reference an object to get the script inside of it. So you have to reference a game object. So that's why master has it and not the slider has audio slider. It's a bit of a misnomer, but it has to be done. And you just throw it into that none where the object is. And now you can access everything within inside of it. For the purposes of this, we're going to access functions. So we're going to click on it. We're going to go to the audio slider class, and we're just going to go to the on-chain slider. Now, there's actually two of these, if you notice. There's one over here somewhere on um, chain slider float, and there's one that, that doesn't have the variable. That's because um, the, the one at the bottom, you don't have to specify what the float is. Um, that's why the top one's called dynamic float, but it's saying this, hey, I noticed that you only have a float in the question here, and a slider uses a float. So can I put it in there? That's what we're going to do, is we're going to do dynamic float. So this throws it right in, and it works. Um, uh, when I get to showing you audio, you'll know that this works, but this slider will affect, affect master audio now, and you really just need to copy and paste this, and you only need to change two things. Numbers that say sound effects, oh, sorry, master volume to whatever you want. And oh, oopsies, forgot that this is on the same animation. And then at the bottom, there's this thing that has um, a string that's label. I'll show you why later. That's a little sound thing, but um, it's a string, so you can dynamically code it here without having to go back into Unity Editor. It makes it so you only need one slider. But if you play the game right now, we're going to have an issue. And that issue is the game looks like this. So not only does the menu pop up immediately, um, but you're going to have things overlapping. And that's because the object is active in terms of gameplay. Um, and what this boils down to is that all game objects and that are like this color are active in the game. Is there. Like I said, it's purely cosmetic. It means nothing to do gameplay. So when game starts, all of these objects are active, so they play. So that comes to a very annoying problem. Since the pause holder has two different menus, it has the regular pause menu and it has the options menu, they both appear and overlap. 
because if this one's active, those two are active. So there's two ways to fix this. The first one is to code it so you make a general code that basically makes it so um, whenever the primary menu is up and the secondary menu isn't, or you make it so you check every alternate box. Now I'm going to be using some terminology to explain this. I'm going to call the menu that you want to pop up first the base menu, and then everything else that comes from that, like a pop out from that, is a alternate menu because it comes from it. So the pause menu exists first. Like if you look at this guy, like you have the pause menu, you hit the options, and then it goes to the options menu. So that's an alternate menu. The reason I'm bringing that terminology up is because this is going to get weird. So the first code is basically, hey, I have this alternate menu that I want you to disable at start time. Um, so when you see, as you can see, on enable, so when this object is enabled, disable the alternate type. So this code will be added to the base menu, and then you have to do this. So if you have multiple alternate menus, like if you had a friends list as well, or a social page, you have to have probably a list of menu objects that you want to disable and just iterate through that list. But honestly, that means that you have to add code to every single menu that's going to have multiple stuff. And that's only because you have to open your Visual Studio editor. I prefer a different edit. I prefer this. Every alternate, every alternate uh, menu that exists, you'll just hit the checkbox when you're done with it. That checkbox makes it so when the game starts, it is not enabled. It's nice and simple. You check that box. And first off, that makes it so when you're using the editor, you don't see it anymore. That's why I'm telling you to use the eyes for actual editing. But once you want to actually test gameplay, you're going to use these checkboxes so it affects gameplay. Everyone straight on that? It's a bit weird. So then let's actually have the buttons do something instead of being pretty placeholders. So as we did the slide of the floor, the button has a very similar function. It's just um, on click, which is really like a normal statement. So we're going to add the list, same way we did before. And now we're going to add functions. And then we're going to add, um, we're going to do something for the UI elements. So for functions, again, we're going to throw an object with a script that you want to call. So in this case, I am throwing in the sound manager. So the sound manager is right here at the top. Since they're singletons, I have them like existing right at the very top there. I'm just going to drag them over and write in the object. And then we're going to call the sound manager and you're going to say, hey, I want you to play, I want you to call the UI with pause close function. That's code for plays a button the sound every time this is called. So every time that button is pressed, that sound is called. Uh, so in that case, it's the push button sound effect. Shocking. I made a button use a, button, a push button sound effect. And now it just works. Uh, now we're going to have one more, which this is for UI elements, and this is how you make menus switch between each other. So what you're going to do is you're going to grab the UI object that you want to disappear. So the little shading for all the different elements in that menu that you don't want to appear, and that you don't want to appear when a button is pressed. So you're going to put the UI object in, and you're going to go to that object. And this is, this is technically doing the same thing that that checkbox does in the inspector except this that happens during runtime. So it's a lot more useful. And you're just going to say set active, it's a B. And whenever this button exists, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to check the box or you're not going to check the box. If you check the box, that means you want it to appear when this button's pressed. So at the options menu, if you're using the options menu button, you're going to have the option menu UI element set active to true or check box. And then you're going to have the main menu option uh, set to false, which you can see right here if you look. Uh, this is the options menu. I have it set to active, so it appears. This is blocked out. This is the pause menu, and it's set active to false. And now whenever the options menu button is pressed, it works, and it looks pretty. Well, more accurately, you just can't tell that I'm doing weird stuff to it. So, and that's basically UI in a nutshell. Um, so all the functions work like that. Uh, for the options menu, the pause button, or the start of the back button. 
Um, I can't go far enough back to show it. But the back button would just be the opposite of this, where it makes the pause menu active and the options menu inactive. And um, the game, um, as you saw earlier, or maybe not of, I made the game manager have a function that ends the game. So the exit button literally just says, hey, game manager, turn off the game. So that's how stuff works. And now we're going to get on to sounds so I can actually show you some of the more cool stuff that we did with this UI. So I want you to think of sound in this terms. Go ahead. Just a real quick, what if you want like more control over the UI button, like you want it to react to the player if the player is like covering their mouth? So that's actually, um, that's already in the code, actually. Uh, if you notice here, right here, oh, and by the way, for people watching, he asked what happens if you want like more control of it. Uh, for the most part, you can actually just use this color right here. So highlight, press, selected. Um, I actually already have that existing in the code where the color shade changes. And like I said earlier, when you change this color from anything, it's going to overlay and try to change that image to kind of color scale to it. Okay. Um, if you want it to do something more dynamically, um, what you're going to do is a lot of button objects have all these, all these existing functions. So what you do is you pass in a script that takes the button and you take the script and you say on cover called. And then like for example, you want to do a sound. So on cover call, you would just make a function that references to that. Uh, the override function. Uh, because um, by default, it's an abstract concept, which basically just means they want you to decide about it, what it does. And we're going to override it and we're going to say, hey, sound manager, when this function's called, I want you to do that. Um, you can also do event listeners. Um, you'd have to look that up, but you have some nice event listeners that you can do, similar principle. Go ahead. This is just a random thought, but what if you had like a UI manager that had a stack of menu objects and then just clicking a button would add this menu object to the stack, and then clicking another okay. button on that menu would add another. That, um, yeah. yeah, you can definitely do that, but you do there. Um, probably you have to pass in either a string or a uh, enum, and you make it so when I think the actual manager is called, you say, Hey, I want you to activate this menu and then just disable whatever menu is currently active as a variable. Behind the scenes, in a way, this is what's happening. Right? Yeah. There's C ordering. So if you added another UI element to the viewport and they just sat on the top, that's like a visual stack. And when you delete it, it's popping it off the stack. So that's when you're interacting. Yeah. It's very much. Oh, you said stack. Okay. You meant stack like that. Like the. Like the you meant the data structure. The data structure. The data that. Stack, that's yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can implement a stack for that. It's just that. Um, Honestly, I don't see a use case where you need that that often um, because more often than not, you're only going to have one or two UI objects active at a time. So having a stack, I, I guess it could work um, if you're doing like, like effects graphics, perhaps. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about nested menus and how like, yeah. one menu will lead to another menu. And oh. I definitely do that. That's that's one hundred percent possible. I can see that. It's, it's more of a graph, right? Each menu yeah. is a node, and it has connections to other ones that are like links, right? Just like a website, you can imagine mm -hmm. it as a graph. Yeah, that would be the big structure to think of it. Yeah. Um. Unfortunately, we do have to move on. We've got another forty slides to go. So, um, think of so. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a master class that's going to be the dad to all of the other sound effects. So I know they're all in line here, but what you can imagine is one big sound master and then three sounds that come from it. And I'll show you why in a second you need to think about it that way. But basically, master in itself should have no sounds. Every sound should be able to be divided into your subsounds. So your sound effects, your dialogue, your cutscenes, really, there should be different examples here, but that's just what I thought of at the time. So you want to make sure that each one of those subsets, so sound effects, dialogue, cutscene, has a similar decibel uh, leveling. So you don't want one that's eight decibels and one that's 10, because then the slider is useless to the user. Um, you can use audacity or to a very limited extent immunity for that. Um, but basically, oh, that's just the MP3. Uh, no, before, that's MP3. Uh, but whenever you uh, it'll automatically uh, translate it to the UV engine, and you can see it as this. 
So there is, as you can see, there is some stuff you can mess around with and tinker with it. Uh, you can normalize it, you can change the quality of it and how it works. I wouldn't mess around with it too much because it's just not that useful. Audacity is a free software and it works better and it has a lot of effects. That's what I do. Um, but basically what you're going to do is you're going to have all of those saved in some folder. I have an audio folder in the content and you're going to have all your sources. So a simple example of an audio source is just throw it on an object and say, go at it. So this is an arrow um, prefab. And I say, as long as this exists, there's a sound source that plays this sound. And that's annoying. And you don't always want something that basic. So I'm going to show you a more complicated way of doing this. Unfortunately, it involves a lot of code. Um, so um, with the sliders, there is going to be something with this. So. You're going to need a few things. The first thing is an audio mixer. It's literally just an object you can throw in. And by default, it will have a master object. Uh, you just click on it twice, and it'll give you a menu or a window. That window is going to show you all the game, all the you can see. So what you're going to do to actually add a new sound is you're going to click on master. So make sure master's eye loaded, and then add a new thing. So I named it sound effects. And it, see how it's inherited from master? That means when you change this volume of master, it changes the volume of sound effect. That is important because if you don't do it, master volume means nothing. And that's just what you're going to do. And as you can see, there's different sliders. So you can actually have default values for this. And um, don't let your number go above zero for volume. You will definitely use a quick, like 10 decibels here is break your headphones loud. So, Keep that in mind. Uh, you want to have negative numbers. Uh, if you haven't done video editing before, you should be familiar with the concept. But basically, you want to have something in the range of like negative 20 to negative 40. That's usually what sounds like. Um, but yeah. So now we're going to have some variables exposed so we can actually edit it. So what you're going to do is you're going to go over to it and you're going to click on volume. You can right click on volume directly. It's going to ask you if you want to expose it. You're going to expose it. And then you can see here in the actual mixer, you see exposed elements. I'm going to change the name to whatever you need. And the reason I'm reading them is because, as you saw earlier, we actually have these strings. And these words here are going to match the exposed parameters here. So when I call it later in the function, it, I can just pass it as a string, and I never have to go into code. So this is a dynamic way. Okay? Uh, to make it so sound effects work um, in a certain way. So as you saw, like this, and this is directly from the audio slider code I showed you. So if you want to add more exposed variables, I would just update this right here so you can actually see what, what your options are for associating. Just because you don't want to have to have issues with sound just because you forgot what the name is. And uh, now you're just going to kind of just work with it. So. It, Basically, out of the 10, it's going to work now. So we're going to go to your output, and you're going to offer it to something. So we're back to the arrow, and this is just, by default, it will play, I believe, but you won't be able to change the volume at all by changing the output to the sound effects mixer that ties it so whatever the sound effect mixer is at, that's the volume it's going to be at, also relative to master. So it's like if your computer volume is at 20 and your game volume is at 60, it's not really 60, it's like uh, 60 of 20. Um, so this is the sound line again. It's a bit complicated, but I can go down pretty easily. Um, this is just saying, if it's playing a game, play the music I've specified as game music. If not, play menu music. Um, uh, this overlaps, flip new state, same principle. Um, it's just different. Um, actually, no, it's the exact same thing. That's what uh, and then these are just specific like sound effects I want to play at this instance. So I just I specify a sound effect source, which is what I showed you earlier, and that's play clip. So those are hard coding functions for sound. This is where you're going to get um, I don't want to call it soft coded, but um, this is where we're actually going to get dynamic stuff. So we have two versions of it: this version, which I don't like as much, and this version that I do. And this is because you can pass in that enum without having to specify um, sound effect source. So when you use this version, you have to input the variable that is the sound source, and that's just annoying to do. So instead, you can just make 
a enum type. So as you see here, it's just audio event type music. And by doing that, when you send it in, it'll just automatically move the audio source. Keep in mind when you add more audio sources, like if you added a dialogue source, you need to go to the switch case and you need to add a new case for um you need to add a new case for that dialogue type. Just keep that in mind. Um, but this I like the one on the far right better just because you don't need input sources. Let me just go through stuff really quickly. So we now have an audio source that this is, and sorry, where is that? Yeah, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our sound manager that I pointed out earlier, but we're gonna actually give it the sound manager of, of script so you can edit what it exists. So with this, you can describe everything you need. So you can see at the top, there's the three sound effects that are specified. That would just be click on them and you can say, hey, this specific sound bite I want you to use, or MP3 really, or WAV file. Um, these are lists, close the middle. Um, and what happens is just every time you hit plus, you need to add a sound to it. If you don't, you're gonna break something because it's gonna send in a no sound, and that's not good. Uh, but that makes it so you can have a list of objects and you can randomize what song plays. So if you're like 10 music, so uh, 10 menu sounds, you want to play uh, menu songs, sorry, because you don't want individual sound effects for a menu that get annoying quickly. Uh, and then the very bottom, those are the audio sources. And that is what you'd have to do for that thing I was telling you about earlier with menu sources. You'd have to import it in using a serialized field and have it existing there. So with that, you can just kind of do whatever you want with this. You can just put whatever you want in, and now you can actually use the sounds. But there's two ways uh, for it. You can call the audio function, either through the manager or not, or you can use the dynamic functions I showed you at the bottom and at the far right. So I'm going to go through this. We have not seen most of these, actually. So um, with the audio function, it already calls it. So what you're going to do is you're just going to kind of go through it. And as you can see, it just says sound manager play clip. Uh, so this is the dynamic version of it, by the way. Uh, so this is dynamically calling the code. So you can say, hey, I have this clip that I want you to play. So just throw the clip and then audio event sound effect. So whatever that clip is, it's sound effect. It's going to go to the sound manager. It's going to register the sound bite and it's going to play it. So that's the reason that we have a sound manager. So I don't need to have that code exist every time for like damage ticks, for like walking, anything that I want, I just do a one line call to it. Keep in mind, you will need to have a variable for the uh, sound effect, or you can make a giant list of all the sound effects, but that sounds like a nightmare. Um, and that's basically right there. So we can also call the function from here, but that's whatever. Uh, now you can have the prep sound effects. Prep comes in two flavors. Uh, the first flavor is using the sound manager and having the sound manager have a specific sound bite in, uh, in a function. Uh, that is what I showed with the UI open button press menu. And as I said before, you've already seen what this is. You just throw in with the function, you say, hey, I want you to call this function. This function calls a sound effect. Sound manager does it all for you. It's nice and easy. Second way is that you literally just throw in a sound object and you throw it in that way. So does that come together now? We're seeing how all this ties together. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. All right, and now time for the final one that isn't tied to anything. But I will get through this quickly because it's very easy. So. Very simple coding. You need four scripts, but these are nothing. You're going to need a spawn rate, which is really just a list. It's a fancy list we're going to make because we want it to have certain variables. It's called a scriptable object, but we'll get into that a bit later. Uh, we're going to have a spawn manager because it's always good to have a manager for overarching high ideas, and spawn is one of those. Uh, utilities, we're going to actually make a spawner. This is literally just an attribute you give to an object, and it will make it so you can have tweaks to it, so like certain spawners can be more aggressive or higher level enemies, for example, or not active at certain points. Um, and I should have added the last code, but I didn't. So ignore the fact that it says four when the list is three. Um, so this is literally the entire list. So this is called a scriptable object. It's not that hard to understand, but explains a bit weird. 
So they're very, very top. You see the file name. That's just telling you that the Unity engine, when you right click, is going to be an object that you can actually import in. So that's literally all that is at the top. Um, ignore the order. That's just a, it's just a necessary thing you need to put in. Um, so system serializable, that's because we want it to actually be a list and actually be usable. So we're going to go in and those two variables you see right there, min, row, and prefab, that is going to be every list object is going to have those two variables. So min, row is the minimum way that it'll spawn in. And prefab is just what enemy do you want me to spawn in? So what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, cool. I have a list of these objects now. How do I use them? Well, we're just going to call a function, get a random enemy. This is how I decide to implement the random enemy. It's not really random that much. Uh, you can make it harder, but I was strapped on time. So that just works. Um, you can actually very easily just change that up a little and make it a bit harder. But that's a two guys if you want to do it. Um, spawn manager is a bit more difficult. It just keeps a few variables. So whenever that is the way down. So whenever the room starts, it adds it. Hey, it goes. Um, Sorry, so start wave is just like, hey, the wave is now this number. This is a little dangerous. So it's as a private variable because it's a public variable. Someone could just dump that function and say, come on, wait a million now. And they get all the achievements, right? We don't want that. So it's private variable that you can only call from other public functions. And here's a few things. Um, that debug log is just because things were breaking earlier. And then update, this is to make sure that when the wave is done, it actually sets to done. And start code team is basically means it's a time function. Not that time that we talked about earlier in Unity Engine. It's a different one because it uses your computer's time. So it's just, hey, um, you have to call it as a special function. It's called the enumerator function. And instead of having a return, it's a return new. You can have as many as you want. And it literally just reads the code straight down, but whenever you need a return, it gets you a lambda function. So in this case, we're just using a time wait seconds. Um, this is a little fancy way I did it because time deteriorates between waves, and I don't want it to wait for negative seconds because time travel isn't something you want you need to have. Uh, and then once it actually works, it will call the start wave function by, by adding one to the wave function and saving it with that extra one. So. Simple, right? Uh, last one is a spawner, and this code is basically nothing. It's just long because it has to be. Uh, update is basically, hey, if I'm not waiting, but the wave is active, I want to start waiting because you don't want the spawner to be spawning when the wave is down. Um, and then else, if it is waiting, but the wave is active, it's going to stop waiting. So you see that at the top it says stop our coding teams? That's just me hitting the brakes because theoretically one of these can be running, but um, we don't really need it to run. So I'm just stopping it. It technically is safe. Even if I didn't call that stop code team, if the wave was done, it wouldn't do anything. But it just saves a little bit of CPU in your computer. So that's nice. And then spawning an enemy is really easy. You just go to the wait list that we had earlier, which I'll show you how to actually add things to that later. And you say, hey, if I ram an enemy, once I get them, I want to bring them to the world, that's instantiate. And then I want to need his location to be my location. And then I'm going to send back to the spawn manager that I've spawned someone in. And that's so only a certain amount of spawns happen per wave, which you can see here. It's not here. Basically, it's just a little function that says, hey, every time someone will spawn, subtract the current spawn by one. So this function, update function, actually terminate, uh, happens. So uh, I made a bit of spawn because I wasn't going to make a graphic of a spawner, and Minecraft is copyrighted, so I couldn't use their spawner. So I entered it in the scripts, um, and then I also gave, uh, I also made a new object under the game manager. That part isn't needed. I just like it when you because it's pretty. Um, and I gave you a script of spawn manager. I gave it some values. Uh, these were testing values. I don't think they should be in the game. Uh, but basically, the rate delay is 0.1 seconds, and the decay factor is 0.05 seconds. So within two rounds, there is no rate between waves. So uh, choose those numbers. 
Um, and then I'm going to show you how to actually make the list. And this is how you're going to add enemies to that queue. So you don't have to tell it what spawn you want. So you're going to go to the create, uh, you're going to go to the editor, you know, right click here, you're going to hit create, script the raw lift, weights. So very easy. Once you do that, you're going to have this little weird looking object. And this is a scriptable object icon. Click on that, you'll be able to see the list. From that list, you can add an element, the same way you'd add an element to a regular list or to the um, functions that I showed you with buttons and sliders earlier. And you can just add the function. And by having this, anyone that references a spawn list will just have access to all these variables, which is really nice. Uh, you can also do some fancy stuff where you have extra variables for certain types of en enemies, like if some are ranged, some aren't. Um, but that's beyond the scope of today's work. Um, so yeah, now we have a spawner. Um, the script is added to it, and you just need to make sure that it has access to the actual um, wave object. So you're just going to click on it, and you're going to say, hey, connect the list to a list. Very simple. Go ahead. Uh, do all fields in a scriptable object need to be serializable? Yeah. Do all fields in a scriptable object need to be serializable? No. Um, so first off, serialize field is a misnomer. It has nothing to do with what it sounds like. It's just, hey, I want you to appear in the editor. That's what serialized field means. Scriptable object is just, hey, this is an object that I'm making myself that I want the Unity editor to recognize and I can use in the Unity editor. So like I have my script, which is a list. This, oh, come on. Why aren't you showing? Stop being obtuse about it. There we go. So as you can see here, like this is an object that doesn't exist in the engine native. This is something that I'm specifying to them. So that's why I had that weird code at the top that told it where to put it in the menu. Like when I specify the so you see that code on line six? Yeah, line six. That's telling it, hey, I want to make a new scriptable object, and it's called spawn weights. And 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 you recognize it, see it doesn't cause any errors, and that's cool. I'm good cool with that. So when I go into the editor and I hit create, it exists now. That's all scriptable object is. A scriptable object can be theoretically anything. Yeah, okay. Can you go back to that slide where you define the scriptable object thing? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So on uh on line say 17, right above mm -hmm. that you have serialized field. Yeah. If that wasn't there, if it didn't say serialized field, would you be able to otherwise edit that? No. So um Okay, sorry, I misunderstood your question. So the serialized field actually gives you the way to edit the list because all of this around it is really just me making a custom class, really, or structure, really. Um, so it's making custom structure and making it a unique way. So it's just a special container within Unity that I can use. Um, it's a list function, mostly because I don't want to have to create my own list database. It's just useless to do so. If you're making a waiting list, it may be worth it to make a waiting list. Um, but that would get complicated pretty quick because you can't make a scriptable object um, from a scriptable object. So you couldn't make a weighted list for a scriptable object. It'd have to be like a game object. I'm getting in the weeds. Um, do you understand relatively well what I'm getting at? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so we have the scriptable object, we have the spawner that recognizes the spawn list. That's it, that, that works. So in this game now, there's some sound effects. You can add more really, really quickly. Um, currently the slash makes a sound effect, buttons make sound effects, and then there's music that plays in the game and the arrow makes sounds. But this code's there for everything. Like this is highly modular, and that's why I have all of this, all these slides to go over it. Because realistically, you can just use the code you saw today to make other things. So that's kind of what I want to go over. Um, you can use it. I think it's like two lines of code to save the presets for audio. I just didn't do it because I wanted to give you guys something to do. Um, game over screen because currently the game breaks when he dies, which isn't optimal. Um, but I thought that would be pretty simple to do because it is. Um, you can also make a main menu if you wanted. Um, use the new render pipeline to make post processing. I'm gonna to, I'm gonna get back to that third point because I think it's broken. Um, don't get me on that though. 
Um, you can add more sound types, so you can make dialogue, you can make um, ambient sound effects, environment sound effects very easily. And a weighted list, or just a weight to the list. So um, even though this can spawn on a certain wave, they're not likely to spawn on a certain wave. You can do that. Even if it's just as simple as adding a weight, where it's like, hey, how likely is this to exist? You can do that pretty easily. And if you have any questions on that, uh, you could always just message me on this. That's about it. And we made time. Really cool.